wonderful, delightful surprise it is yet to know that you have been able to join me. You will, of course, I am aware that Christmas is a very hectic, busy, stressful time of year for, for so many people. Therefore, the fact that you have been able to find time in your, no doubt, busy schedules to join me for the next hour or so, it really does mean more to me than you could ever possibly know. Oh, good heavens. What on earth are my manners? Well, my name is Montague Rose James. You but please, you would be doing me an inestimable service. Would you be so kind as to call me Monty? Well, as I was saying, at this time of year, Christmas, as December draws to its inevitable close, it is something of a tradition when friends and family members gather together to share memories and reminiscences, to regale one another with tales of what is past and of what they hope to be in the year to come. And of course, of course, what would Christmas time be without ghost stories? Well, now you have been so kind as to join me, Montague Rhodes James. I would very much like to share with you the one or two ghost stories that I happen to be aware of. Now you are aware, of course, of my role as an antiquarian, a scholar. I have also found time down the years to uh, unleash upon the world a handful of ghost stories of my own devising. And those, of course, were fictional works, summoned up from the depths of my imagination, as such as it is. However, the stories that I wish to share with you now are all based on fact. I've been an inveterate hoarder of papers and scrapbooks and journals, and other ephemera for more years now than I care to mention. Amongst these letters are two case studies, as it were. A curious tales. The tales concerning individuals whose lives up until that juncture had been nondescript enough. Nonetheless, theirs were lives that suddenly were intruded upon by the supernatural, unbidden, it is true. And yet for all of that, when the supernatural did come calling, its presence was made known with some degree of force. Before I proceed, the following did take place. In one instance, only the letters of the correspondent are known to me. In the other, although the basic facts are to remain unchanged, I have felt it prudent to alter just one or two details. Whether or not you believe in ghosts is quite immaterial. The following did take place. You ought to ask yourselves not whether you believe in ghosts, but if ghosts believe in you, what then? Our first tale, ladies and gentlemen, our first tale begins with a collection of correspondence of some letters that came into my possession some years ago. The actual name, indeed the location of this tale, remained to me as much a mystery as they were then. Nonetheless, the events described all took place one Christmas time. However, the outcome of these events were as far from being festive as one could humanly imagine. Now, 
You might remember earlier my saying that I have in my possession the diary that once belonged to the late Dr. Haynes, a former archdeacon of Barchester Cathedral. There is still much mystery surrounding his sudden death. And although I have consulted the pages, the almost sacrosanct pages of his diary, nonetheless, I feel that he was being reticent, that there was still much more he could have written pertaining to the fears, the terrors even, that assailed his thoughts during those last few weeks of his upon this earth. Now, at the juncture where we join Dr. Haynes, it is the birthday of the previous incumbent of the post that he so covets, Dr. Pulteney of Barchester Cathedral, celebrating his 92nd year. Well, indeed, ladies and gentlemen, it seemed that that worthy old gentleman was going nowhere, and that surely Dr. Haynes' ambitions of succeeding to the post of the Archbishop would come to naught. However, such is serendipity, a curious thing. For scarce a week had passed before the tragedy happened. It was the sister of Dr. Haynes, Letitia, who broke the news to her brother. Oh, good heavens, Letitia, what, why are you in tears? What, what is happening here? Speak up. Dr. Pulteney? No, I, I have not heard the news. What, what has happened to him? Dead, you say? Well, I do not understand. He fell down the stairs and broke his neck. Well, when did this happen? This morning they found him. Well, wait, I, I do not understand. Why does the Maid, what is this to do with Jane? Well, why must she be dismissed? You calm yourself, Letitia. The missing sterile. Well, that is why he tripped. He, that is why he fell. Well, yes, I, I suppose you will need to be dismissed. I, yes, I, I had not thought. Yes. Yes, of course. Yeah, please, Letitia, dry your eyes. I, I need time in which to think of this awful news. And so, ladies and gentlemen, it transpired that indeed uh, the maid Jane had been remiss in her duties. The missing sterod was indeed found, tucked away, it would seem, hidden from human sight. That and the missing tag, leading to the carpet being loose upon the stair had no doubt led to the unhappy demise of the much beloved gentleman, Dr. Pulteney. It is a curious thing, the serving maid, Jane, I mean. You see, I have consulted Dr. Haynes' accounts books. It was at around the same time as the sudden dismissal of the maid. Dr. Haynes made a payment of 40 pounds, and thereafter a sum of 25 pounds to her each quarter. There is a letter also amongst Dr. Haynes' papers, not signed but initialed, J.L. In it the writer says that though she and her husband are loath to ask Dr. Haynes, Nonetheless, they are struggling for money, and he has money. And therefore, he will be so kind as to pay them a sum. They would very much dislike having to tell the authorities of the certain facts they know pertaining to the late Dr. Pulteney's sad demise. And we make of that what we will. Nonetheless, Dr. Haynes entered into his position of archbishop with alacrity, indeed zeal. In many ways, he writes, it was for the best that Dr. Pulteney had died. 
by me to say, the state of the cathedral's finances was in disarray. He had been a generous to a fault, had the late Dr. Pulteney. So much so that things really needed to be put into order once more. Dr. Haynes reckoned this would take at least three years. And so it did. From that point on, I read that Dr. Haynes developed a sudden mania for the architecture of the cathedral. In particular, my attention is drawn to the new prayer desk and a certain other rather outre ornamentation. Now I read that the wood from this was taken from a nearby copse, a close to Barchester, oak and what have you. Even to this day, a certain superstitions are whispered abroad regarding the old hanging oak. It was said that a great quantity of human bones were found buried amongst the roots of that venerable tree. Furthermore, if one wished to have one's deepest desires accepted and granted, and one's wishes were to be written upon paper and hung from the boughs, or else a small wooden poppet to be depended thereon. The artisan. The artisan who is responsible for these new items of decoration, a certain gentleman named Mr. John Austin, and more of whom are not. It is at around this juncture, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Haynes writes he's beginning to experience troubled sleep, bad dreams. It all seems to begin from around the point of September. It was during one evening's Magnificat. Dr. Haynes writes that, regretfully, he may have fallen asleep, or it was, at the very least, in a light doze. His hand was resting upon the prayer table, and one of the sculptures thereon. Ah! Although he knew this to have been made of oak, suddenly the figure was warm, soft, and supple, as though it were a body writhing around said to bite Dr. Haynes. Well, the other members of the cathedral turned around with some alarm, wondering what on earth might have happened. <laughs> Later that evening, Dr. Haynes writes how for the first time he pays a special attention to this ornamentation, and that figure that he had been resting his hand upon. Evidently, it was that of a cat, wonderfully well executed. Beside the cat, perhaps it was as well the figure did not reveal its face. And for all of that, enough was seen. Though the figure was concealed beneath a robe. Awfully long talon fingers could be seen protruding from the ends, resting upon the knee. And there, cloven hooves. And there also, perhaps most terrifying of all, king of the terrors himself. What could be seen of the face left just enough to the imagination to make one's worst fears realize the skin rotted and peeling and that tied about the midriff of the figure surely that was a halter a hanging rope but around this time in the diary dr haynes notes the house in which he and his sister live is far too large, for the two of them, I mean. And indeed, this sense of unease only increases when Letitia leaves her brother alone for several months. Her health
something is rather delicate, you understand, as she goes to the seaside in order to convalesce. You'll forgive me, I feel certain. If I relate to you the following extracts, there's a complete whole, delivered now as though they were by the late Dr. Haynes, if he was still alive in person. Very, I believe. The darkness is beginning to prey upon my nerves. I was lighting the candles this evening in the cathedral. <laughs> I could feel the shadows begin to creep about me to encroach upon my own space. I know that it is for my sister's health that you leave me now, but not unless I wish. I wish so very much I was not alone. The house too large for me. My mind begins to play strange tricks. I hear voices, whispered voices. I know I am here alone, and yet one night, in the middle of October, I I was retiring to my bedchamber when I heard a voice. Let me whisper you good night. My imagination, I feel certain, but I'm, you may be certain I hurried on to my bedchamber and locked myself willing. Yes, a week later, I, uh, I found I had left my pocket watch downstairs in my study. I was loath to leave my bedroom, and yet for all of that, I, I, I had little choice. I, I had made it as far as the first landing. I heard a voice whispered in my ear. Well, I had a lighted candle. It was as well that I did not drop that. That's what might would have happened. I made my way down the stairs, and uh, all of a sudden, I, uh, there was a large cat between my legs, almost maybe fall. Third step down from the first landing. The kitchen cat, evidently, that I did not know anything about. a few weeks later. And Dr. Haynes writes once more of his fears. I was seated in my study, I'm writing and working until late, close to midnight. I could see things moving from the corners of my eye in the hallway. And though I knew there was no one there. It is a busy space indeed. I, I decided to retire to my bedchamber. I was alone in the house. I shut the bedroom door and I was seated on my bed. Someone knocked upon the door. I heard. May I come in? I wish I could say uh, I was not so much of a coward. I was too frightened to open the door. I cowered within my bed. Why do wake all night? Heaven, my sister Letitia soon will rejoin me. So it is. You understand, just before Christmas, his sister Letitia did indeed return. For a while, his fears receded. And yet Dr. Haynes almost knew this was but a temporary remission, a slight respite. 
before whatever it was that assailed him, returned with its vigor renewed. Things became so awful for him that eventually he invited a cousin of his to stay. The cousin also notes what a busy a house it is. He remarks to Dr. Haynes how his servants are so noisy. But Dr. Haynes has no servant. Also, the cousin named Alan remarks upon the large black cat. Dr. Haynes right. We have no black cat. It always is there, watching me and waiting. I hear voices whispering into my ear, awful sounds. They say wicked things. in the cathedral I, I placed my hand upon the prayer table and felt awful wet wet and smooth and deathly cold <gasps> the sound of the whispered voice like wet lips close in my ears just last night I I awoke and I was standing on top of the stairwell. I don't know how I got there myself. I have not known myself to sleepwalk. Imagine if I had fallen. And then I looked and believed that there was that cat waiting for me. It was two steps down. Perhaps my brain is fading. Perhaps this is decay. I need to work, I, I need to, I need to work and, and, and pray to the Almighty Lord that he spares me long enough until my work is done. And so Dr. Hayes continues in this alarming vein until the end. It was a bleak February morning, the 26th of February as a matter of fact. Chance visitant to his home. Upon receiving no reply, the door is open. And then, just as the mantel clocks chime, they enter the hallway. And there, lying like a broken marionette doll, sprawled at the bottom of the stairs. Dr. Haynes. neck broken, and when they turn the body over, the injuries upon the face, the wounds, cold flesh picked away, scratched to the bone, what little remained of the face, for evidence of extreme fright and horror. Well, of course, ladies and gentlemen, it seems apparent that Dr. Haynes was responsible for the untimely demise of his predecessor, Dr. Pulteney. Furthermore, of course, no doubt already you will have gathered also that the wood for the prayer table and those other ornamentations that Dr. Haynes had arranged. Now, this was from that particular belt of trees where it stood the hanging oak. But still, I wished to find actual evidence for myself to confirm all of my suspicions. Now, I traveled to Barchester, and there I fell into conversation with the curator of the local museum. From him, I learned that although most of the furniture that had been carved for the cathedral itself had long since been destroyed, there were a few bits and pieces to extend. Now, one of them indeed was upon display. The curator was able to tell me the following. Well, 
of course, and the, I, I quite recall the day that this came into our possession, this rather unattractive item. <laughs> Your local tradesman happened to have acquired it. Yeah, I quite forget from whence. Well, he was toying with the figure. It came apart in his hand, and from within uh, fluttered a piece of paper with writing upon it, but he, he thought a little of it at the time. He uh, apparently uh, popped it inside a vase that stood upon the mantel shelf. Well, uh, some years after that, I happened to be in conversation with this tradesman. I happened to be discussing whether or not he may be able to furnish our museum with a various objet d'art, memorabilia. I was examining the vase in particular, wondering whether perhaps he may be persuaded to part company with it, when from within its interior fluttered this piece of paper. Strange lines written upon it. When in the wood I stood, I was watered with blood. Now in the church I stand. Who dares touch me with his hand? If a bloody hand he bear, then be beware. This I dreamt, 26th of February, John Austin. Now I come to mention it. I asked the tradesman what became of the, uh, the carved monstrosity <laughs> wherein this piece of paper had been concealed. Oh, he said to me, it made his children scared. They would not settle until it was thrown out with the other rubbish. And so, ladies and gentlemen, perhaps now, after this many years, now at last we have arrived at some degree of truth behind the unexpected demise of the late Dr. Haynes and what perhaps led to his fate owing to the storms of Barchester Cathedral itself. And so, ladies and gentlemen, that uncanny tale draws to an end. Do you know, the Punch and Judy form of entertainment was, I believe, what first piqued my interest in the ghost story. I was a young boy, Though I know you must find that very difficult to believe. But even I was young once. I could only have been eight years of age. Then my people took me to attend a Punch and Judy performance. I still remember vividly, even to this day, when the ghost took to the stage. Its long, dreadfully thin body habited in a winding sheet, a ghastly face leering from atop it, its hollow sunken eyes seemingly seeking me out. It impressed itself unfavorably upon me then, ladies and gentlemen, and even now, so very many years later, that awful apparition has been known to revisit me in dreams. Well, for my second tale of this Christmas time, I ask all of you to join me upon the wings of fancy as I travel to Barchester, in particular to the cathedral there. As some of you may still recall the late Dr. Portney the previous archdeacon. 
But as for the gentleman who succeeded him, Archdeacon Haynes, a degree of mystery still hangs over his unexpected outcome. Perhaps, ladies and gentlemen, you will allow me to explain. Ladies and gentlemen, now the following strange tale that I have been able to assemble from the various letters and scraps of correspondence that I have in my possession. Now it is true, I do not even know the name of the narrator as it were. Nonetheless, I have made some inquiries of my own. I believe I know where the events depicted therein took place. Furthermore, I think I might know the identity of the rector, this Uncle Henry, whose disappearance causes this rather unfortunate sequence of events. To begin, you will forgive me, I am sure, if I do not go into further detail. After all, I should not wish any of you to make your own investigations after the event with what I fear may be potentially disastrous consequences. Well, as I've already intimated, the incidents took place Christmas week. The person whose letters I have in my possession, this correspondent was communicated with on or around the 19th of December of that year. He had been due to attend a gathering of friends However, he was forced to abandon that idea as a result of the sudden and rather unexpected disappearance of his uncle, an uncle Henry Lewis, who was the rector of a village some miles distant. Although this young man had not seen much of his uncle down the years, indeed he felt it to be his duty that he ought to return to endeavor to help his family members find their missing relative. If nothing else, it would put their minds at rest, he felt. And during the course of the investigation, the young man happened to put up at an inn, the King's Arms, the proprietor of the same, Mr. Bowman, was able to inform the young correspondent details pertaining to the missing gentleman. Now, as it transpired, the late Uncle Henry had delivered his usual evening sermon on the Sunday evening. All had gone as had been expected. The late rector had hardly been a, a beloved individual. He had been rather an austere man, aloof, Yet, for all of that, never one to shy away from his ecclesiastical duties. Indeed, that is the reason why, after his sermon had finished, he had set off deep into the countryside. He had received word that one of his parishioners, an old gentleman, was seriously ill. And therefore, Henry Lewis's presence was required. He left word with his housekeeper that he ought not to be long. But nonetheless, he was never seen again. Of course, the old man in question, the invalid whom the uncle had visited, he was not a suspect. He was far too ill. Also, his family, the wife, the children, well, of course, they were dismissed immediately by the police authorities. However, the young man, as I have said, put up in an inn, the King's Arms, and there it was, the proprietor, Mr. Bowman, was able to inform the young man, apropos his own views, regarding the missing rector. Well, I said to him at the time, I said, well, 
Oh, Mr. Lewis, he was not a light man as such. No, I'm sorry to say that him and me, we had words. He did words, it were, on account of this misunderstanding. No, I'm not having you believe that him and me weren't friendly. Far from it. No, I point that out now in case you go getting on your own ideas. I would not wish harm to come to anyone, never mind your Uncle Henry. Oh. Well, it's a busy time of year for me, I mean, Christmas, and we have one thing led to another. All oh, this argument over a bit of ale. Oh, I could not remember the proper word for it at the time. Firkin, I mean. Firkin. On account of the my anger got the better of me. You ought to have seen how the rector took on so. Well, he said one or two rather unkind things to me, and as for Ellen, you've seen her serving my ground here. She was in tears. Well, I said to Mr. Lewis, the director that was, I said to him, I will not have that known speaking to my Ellen. Not like that, well. Rector, he got him, he walked out of here. So we never seen him again. Not that it had nothing to do with me, mind you, and I say that to you now. No, I'm a gentleman, but I'm honest, and I'll help the police in any way they can. Well, quite, ladies and gentlemen. Indeed, perhaps the public and feared he had said too much already. It was the following day when the young correspondent, the nephew of the missing gentleman, heard Mr. Bowman, tavern innkeeper, explaining to the police officers how he and the missing gentleman had been on the best of terms and how Mr. Bowman would do all that lay within his power uh, to assist them in their search. However, it soon became manifest. The police were quite at a loss as to where precisely the rector could have gone. A search was made to understand of the surrounding area, on the woodland, the heath, and Mr. Bowman was at pains to point out to anyone who would listen that he was on the very cusp of finding either the missing rector or the people responsible, forever pointing over there or there, or even there, with his walking cane. Surely he's over there, can't you see that? Were you blind or summer? Nonetheless, there had been no snow, and therefore there were no footprints to follow. However, late that afternoon, a thick mist had descended upon the woodland. The missing man's nephew feared that his imagination was beginning to get the better of him. Well, I mean to say, if he suddenly had looked up and had seen emerging from the thicket of trees there, his late uncle, holding his severed head beneath his arm, Really, he would not have been at least surprised. Well, that evening, once more safely ensconced in the inn, perhaps it is not entirely surprising that the young man had rather a curious dream. He had been in conversation earlier that evening in the, in the tavern itself with a travelling salesman. This latter had been highly impressed by a Punch and Judy performance that had been touring the region thereabouts. He was particularly impressed by the Mr. Punch figure. All of this, of course, must have been preying upon the young man's mind. This, you see, would account for the curious nightmare that he had. Well, in the young man's dream, he was seated somewhere in absolute darkness. The darkness indeed was oppressive. It hemmed him in upon either side. But there, just ahead of him, a dim light began to make itself known. Good heaven, it was a punch and duty performance. And yet, a Punch and Judy performance that he had never seen before, and no one indeed that he would care to see again. It was rather 
gruesome, shall we say. The violence that Mr. Punch meted out to his unwilling victims, quite, quite graphic. You understand Mr. Punch went about beating his wife and the policeman in wild abandon. And as their bodies fell lifeless to the stage, the way their frailing limbs twitched and kicked before falling still, not a very pleasant sight. As the performance proceeded, the entire stage began to descend into darkness. And yet not quite that. There was a dull, deep red hue, almost of blood, that suffused the stage. And by the time that Mr. Punch had wrung the neck of the poor baby, this young man had heard the death rattle, and that final <laughs> of a child. He really was not at all keen to see any more, but of course it was a dream. He could do nothing until he had seen all that the dream wished him to see. By then it was quite dark indeed. And Mr. Punch, his evil satanic face, his dull yellow complexion, and fiendish leering smile, appeared from one side of the stage to the next, almost as though the figure of Mr. Punch could appear and disappear, quite at will. Oh! And there he was again, peeping around the wings. And Mr. Punch by then was quite exhausted. It had, after all, been quite a murder spree. And he sat down upon the stage and mopped his brow. What an incredibly lifelike Mr. Punch this is, the young man thought. And hold on. And there was something behind Mr. Punch, and something that could be seen flitting here and there amidst the scenery. The figure crawled or crept dressed in some dark garment, yet the face was hidden, for it was concealed by a white hood. Mr. Punch was entirely unaware of this thing, crawling ever nearer towards him. But the young man in the audience was painfully aware. And although he was loath to give any advance warning to Mr. Punch, nonetheless, felt dreadfully afraid. Nearer and closer still, this masked figure crawled. Mr. Punchy's back was too the same, until some strange presentiment must have alerted him to the imminent danger that he faced. And he turned goodness me, by then he was far, far too late. <coughs> the masked figure leapt upon Mr. Punch and then twitched off that white hood, revealing the awful face beneath. And this wretched appearance, this ghastly visage, pressed into the face of Mr. Punch. Ah! The young man writes how he awoke suddenly. There, peering at him from the window ledge outside, facing the foot of his bed, a large owl, its arms outspread. <sighs> and then the sound of a bell told him the owl flew away, and the young man woke. The following day, of course, the young man fell into conversation once more with Mr. Bowman, 
the innkeeper. Well, I can't, we cannot apologize enough. Young man, I say to you, the, whoever put the cheese on your table this being breakfast time, well, I, I have never heard such a thing. Really, I ain't. Oh, I cannot apologize enough. Well, it's that maid of mine, Elva, who was telling you about her yesterday, wasn't I? Floods of tears she is. Well, I... No, I will not have other people, not like your late uncle, begging your pardon, I'm sure, making her burst into tears, but nonetheless, I will not have her treating you, my guests here, you mean it yours truly, sir, in such a bloody cow, oh, pardon my language, I'm sure, cavalier of fashion, oh, you don't order cheese for breakfast, nor will you have cheese for breakfast. Well, I said to her, I said to her, put that cheese away. She said, why don't you do it yourself? And then she ran off in floods of tears. Well, I don't know. Why you, sir? I do wonder, might you uh, be seen at church later on this morning? Of course, your uncle ain't here, but uh, the curate, he'll be standing in his place. Sure, he will give as good a job as your late Mr. Lewis was able to. Uh, lovely, I say. And your uncle was not the most engaging gentleman. Not that I wish to speak ill of the dead, Mark. You want <laughs> It will. Eleven o'clock, you just find your way to King's Arms Pew. Uh, well, he'll be there, no doubt. <laughs> yeah, you mind you dress up smart, mind you. We do like to keep up appearances around here. Now, the young man writes. I want to two rather curious incidents happened that same day. As he walked toward the church, the two gentlemen were to be seen muttering amongst themselves. The church wardens. Apparently the, the funeral beer had been removed from its usual resting place. It had been laid out as though it, it was needy. And beside it lay that rather moth-eaten funeral pall. And these two gentlemen, of course, had to carry it back its customary cover. But who might have done this? Might it have been an omen of some sort? Well, as the young man had feared, the sermon was perhaps not quite as memorable as he would have wished. Nonetheless, Mr. Bowman had warned him, had he not? The young man decided to return to the King's Arms to uh, sit close to the fire Regrettably, it was rather warm, and he, he might have fallen asleep. However, he was awoken by the sound of some a tumult happening in the, in the square outside. He rose and peered through the window. <laughs> a Punch and Judy performance. He no doubt this was the one that... Uh, the travelling salesman had told him about. Yes, the Italian gentleman, Forresto and Calpigi. Wait, the young man suddenly remembered in his dream that, that Punch and Judy performance. The names of Kidman and Gallop. Strange things are they not, dreams I mean. Well, he sent Ellen, the maid, a message to convey to uh, Forrester and Calpigi. Uh, would they mind awfully if they could perform their matinee uh, directly to the young man? He would take himself to his own room, but if you were to open the window at the same, he would be able to view the entertainments rather well. Ellen did this, and the proprietors of the show were more than happy to oblige. I suppose it would have been close upon the stroke of three that afternoon. The young man, this correspondent, was looking down upon the Punch and Judy show, the, the small tent I'm sure you will all be familiar with. They had a dog, a Toby dog. Yes, well, by now, of course, they are quite common. Back then, when this all took place, they were quite new. There was something palpably wrong with the dog. It seemed frightened throughout the entire performance. Why? It was restless until eventually it leapt out 
from behind the tent, and went dashing away from the square. Well, no doubt it would return again at some point later that day. And there was Mr. Punch. There the policeman, there Mr. Punch's wife. And then he came to the sea, the hangman. Mr. Ketch. Now, ordinarily, of course, uh, you will be aware, no doubt, when the gibbet has been erected upon the stage, it is customary for the, uh, for the condemned puppet, its face concealed by a white cap, to be hoisted aloft. But from where the young man could see, appearing down from above, this was not the case with this performance. There was a man inside the tent, but his face could be seen. It was, it was palpably the face of a man terrified. He looked terrified. His arms and legs were pinioned behind him. There was another figure inside the tent lifting this man. Now this other figure was Woody the man higher and higher toward the gibbet as though he had not weighed anything at all. All of this impressed a young man most disagreeably. Is suddenly the tent toppled backwards and it would have been upon the stroke of four. Over the tent went two figures with it. There was quite a hullabaloo issuing from the square. A figure was seen emerging from the tent, dashing across the square toward the trees. As some of the witnesses said, they saw another figure pursuing the first. But as far as the young man was concerned, no, there, there had been just one. According to his correspondence, the missing uncle, Uncle Henry, was found upon the 26th of December. Well, they had all gone in pursuit of this absconding performer towards the belt of trees. Finally, it had been agreed that only one figure had run away. It tries by might, no matter where they look. Not be seen. Oh! Until he was. Oh dear, he must have fallen rather badly. Had fallen into one of the chalk pits. Had broken his neck. And it was whilst they were making this grim discovery. The missing rector, the late Henry Lewis, was found. His face, his head covered by a white hood, the corner of which projecting from a chalk pit, just the corner, but enough to make his presence known. And then when they dug him up, found it to be the missing man of God. And oh my goodness, how badly had his throat been mangled, cut to ribbons. Well, of course, now both bodies had to be conveyed be back to the town. No one's there. The young man decided to investigate amidst the fallen ten. Quite certain had he been that there was no other figure to be seen. And yet nonetheless he had seen someone within. The figure of a corpse. Lying there amongst the crumpled canvas, grinning up at him, 
Let's attack. Almost with a rift of Sardanicus. The name. The name that was stitched on the side of the canvas. The name of the gentleman responsible for this performance. Hitman and Gala. Hitman and Gala. Now I wonder the young man. Who on earth had he heard that name before? Ladies and gentlemen, we have it. I wish all of you the merriest of Christmases. Indeed, I wish you all that which you would wish for yourselves. May your time, the end of December, be a peaceful one. And may the new year be a herald for all those things that you have long been promising for yourselves. As I said before, these preceding narratives did take place. They were both based upon the facts as known to me at the time. In my experience, the supernatural has an awful tendency to strike without warning, to smite, as it were, as individuals, whosoever it pleases, almost at chance, and quite at random. You might well ask yourselves, but what have you done? Why me? By way of response, perhaps the supernatural would reply, why not you? Ladies and gentlemen, I have done my best. Now, now you have all been warned. 